Book talk begins at 17 minutes and 5 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 666, Cloudvale. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by the lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and people who have channel memberships over on YouTube at craftlet-channel, as well as people who use the Craftlet dedicated app and subscribe there to the premium feed. Thank you. And I can't get a list of your names, so I can't thank you by name. I'm sorry. But this week, the patrons we would like to thank are Louisa Stratton, Wendy Preston, Elnora Rice, Amy Ledoux, Martha Donnelly, and a brand new patron, Susan L.S. Smith. Thank you all so much for your support. We could not do this without you. Really? How are you? I'm okay. (laughs) I think I'm I'm just going to stop there. I kind of had a weekend. But I also kind of had a lousy week last week. So, you know, it's just exciting. And yes, COVID numbers are going up. And yes, surveillance, normal surveillance, what the public health people call surveillance, which is basically checking on reported tests. Like if there's suddenly an outbreak of measles in a location, we know that because of surveillance. And that surveillance is nurses having to type into a statewide system infectious disease spikes. It is the most restrictive piece of software I have ever been engaged with. It's still, okay, in Pennsylvania, it still runs on Internet Explorer. It's almost like Battlestar Galactica when it's just the ships that are not on the network that survive. This is kind of one of those things. It is as secure as you could get without it being paper kept in a dungeon. So I'm good with that. But the reason why I bring it up is because uh, Puerto Puerto Rico is spiking. I think it's 8% of all deaths right now are caused by COVID or or at least COVID related. I I actually think it's caused by COVID. I can go back and find those stats. Anyway, the other thing is, um, yes, wastewater, wastewater surveillance is what they're doing now where they take samples of human wastewater and they look to see if COVID is in the water. That sounds like a horrifying job. And and also a very difficult one, but apparently they've been doing it for a long time with things like polio and God bless them. They know what they're doing. And right now it's the only way we get any numbers. I also got, however, a text from one of the trainers who I worked with for both versions of the Pennsylvania contact tracing crew. And she's been working with a lot of long-term care facilities, nursing homes, group homes, things like that. And she said the numbers are spiking around Western Pennsylvania, at least. We have the same theory that extremes of weather, whether very, very hot or very, very cold, drive people inside to where the air is being circulated through substandard filtration systems. And so anytime we get pushed inside more, we are going to see spikes in COVID. And anytime we're able to be out more, spring and fall, the numbers are going to go down. This is our collective theory. Just, just in case anyone needed another theory. Oh, and by the way, I will share a link. And along with that COVID data, my geeky virologists, who you know during the pandemic, I was talking about quite a bit. They have, they've done yeoman service. There's two different episodes. You really only need to listen to the the shorter roundup, but it's nice to get to listen to the group of virologists talking through this because what they do and I haven't told you what this is yet, what they do is they talk through papers and also newspaper articles based on these papers talking about whether COVID-2 was grown in a lab or not, because this still seems to be something that 
the media likes to talk about. I can tell you that when this idea first came out in 2020, when it first started to get traction, this group of guys started to laugh saying, we wish we could grow something that's this good at being a virus, not because you want people to get sick, but because we don't have the capacity to build anything remotely this good. So that having been said, I've never been overly concerned about the idea of there being lab link connection. However, the really important thing is both in this larger, longer group panel and in the one-off that the host Vincent Racaniello did, where he specifically explains just why we know that it wasn't a lab leak. They do such a good job at calming the waters and really explaining both what we know, what we don't know, because there are things we don't know. The government in China was not really good at getting information out in the beginning, which I get. I'd be terrified too. And, and then the many, many things that we do know about zoonotic disease and because H1 N1, the avian flu, if it jumps from birds to people, it's a thing. There was a wet market in China that sold animals that had what was going to become SARS-CoV-2 in us. Humans have, these things have been transferred to humans in the past. This is not news. Regardless, they go through what we know, what we don't know, what we have learned since 2020, and they are satisfied. So that's five five professionals, all in slightly different fields of immunology and virology. And yeah, I'll link that out if you're at all interested. It's not something you have to watch, even though I think it's fun to watch because it's fun to see their faces. And every once in a while when they roll their eyes, it's kind of funny. But my, mostly it's just listening. And you could be vacuuming, doing the dishes, walking the dog, doesn't matter. But the re- the real reason for this episode's name. This is episode 666. And last week I had us put out a poll saying, are you bothered at all by having an episode named that? And from what I've seen, no, no, it was just me. And I have I have reasons that have nothing to do with satanic influences for not like the number 666, at least as much as if it were a room number. However, last Friday, Aiden walks in looking at their phone and says, um, do we have any bottled water? Yeah, we have a flat of water bottles in the garage. Why? Uh, I think the water grid might go down. We're like, what? This was the beginning of the Cloudflare panic on Friday, which Aiden described it as Y2K 24 years later. And it certainly could have been. It turned out not to be that dramatic. But Because these are days when everybody is making up their own explanations about how these things happen and also why. I was very, very happy this morning to see on my YouTube feed a video from a Windows engineer, former Windows engineer, explaining how this happened, why it happened, and that it's probably going to happen again. But then in the middle part, you're going to be going like, I don't speak this language. Why is Heather telling me to do this? Because at the end, he actually teaches you how to undo the blue screen of death, at least for this particular issue. And it's, you know, it's that rule of threes. You can have it fast, you can have it right, or you can have it cheap, but you can't do all three. So this was fast and cheap. That's how our corporate structure works these days. Lowest common denominator when it comes to money, fastest for speed, and quality is going to suffer. And that's what happened this time. So it was, it's lovely. It's like an 11 minute video, and it really put my mind at rest because I thought, oh, I don't, I mean, I'm not working off a PC all the the time anymore. But if I had to, I would now no longer be worried if I was being taken over by bots or whatever. Putting your heart at rest, all is going to be fine. I hope nothing else happens in between this when I'm recording this and when the audio comes out. Um, However, that middle section where I was like, I don't understand a word this guy is saying made me think, oh God, this sounds just like the retro encabulator video. So then I went down that rabbit hole. There is a whole story behind a series of prank uh, articles, 
fact sheets and videos, like um, in-house videos, you know, like safety videos. If you worked at a nuclear power plant, they would show you Heather walking along and pointing out the different parts of where you're supposed to do things if there is, in fact, an emergency. Stuff like that. The Turbo and Cabulator video, the short version is, it's all tech jargon. It means nothing. It was written up as a script. It's written up kind of like a short story. And then it became a publication in a student magazine. And then it became a Time Magazine article where I can't tell if they knew it was a joke or not. And then GE picked it up and made their own funny version. And then that snowballed. And in the 70s, another group made another version in the 80s and another version in the 90s. But the actor, the older actor, if you ever see clips of the older guy, he was one of the people who did those safety and security videos for all of these big companies that had, you know, IBM, AT&T, all of these people, General Electric. And so at the end of one of their sessions shooting a regular real video, he asked the guys, since they finished early, if he could record something and that they would just film him. There are no cuts. There are no edits. He has this thing memorized, which is impressive because it doesn't mean anything. Like the verbs are occasionally real words. Everything's a real word. It's just not put together in a way that has any real meaning. And he did it in one take. And at the very, very end, you can hear the crew laughing in the background. I did not know any of that. All I knew about was the 1997, a meme before there were internet memes, retro encabulator video. So this is pre-YouTube. And I don't know where it first got shown, but God bless him for making it because this guy is phenomenal. If you have never seen it, all of these links are going to be in the show notes. I'm going to play you 30 seconds right now of the beginning of the retro encabulator. This is the 1997 video. Just so you can hear what I mean, so that when you do go look at the Cloudflare video, once it starts sounding like that, you're going to be able to go, yeah, this is part I don't need to pay attention to. Unless you're a Windows computer genius guy, in which case, here, you can tell us all if this guy is completely correct. Because while the, the solution makes perfect sense to me, that, and therefore I trust him, the little part of the why, I'm not so sure. So here is, for your listening pleasure, the beginning, just the beginning of the comedy short the retro encabulator. Such an instrument comprised of Dodge gears and bearings, Reliant electric motors, Allen Bradley controls, and all monitored by Rockwell Software is Rockwell Automation's retro encabulator. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modial interaction of magneto reluctance and capacitive directance. So along with solving all of our technological problems from last week, a uh, reminder that Christmas in July bookmark exchange emails went out last Friday, Friday the 19th. Uh, if you have not gotten your email, please let me know and I'll get the word to Tracy and we will get that all fixed up. Don't forget that we have a raffle. Is this the last week? Oh my gosh, it is, isn't it? It's the last week that I'm going to be doing a July raffle. We have more stuff coming in August, and I will have the new book and movie announced for you in next week's episode, so the very beginning of August. But this, once again, if you haven't seen them before and are in YouTube, you can see the beautiful little coaster set with bookmarks that Susan made that are lovely. They're just gorgeous and really nicely made. Like, they feel good in your hands. It's nice. This Thursday, before this episode comes out, will be the Big Sleep Movie Watch Night. So if you had joined in with us, I hope you enjoyed the Big Sleep with me. Eric has put up uh, Alice in Wonderland and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And War of the Worlds is in process and may be done by the time you hear this. All of these should be available for you on Patreon and on the Craftlet app as well. Again, if something goes wrong and you can't, for whatever reason, find it, but you can write Heather at craftlet.com or Eric, E-R-I-K at craftlet.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 206-350-1642. Let me know if you want your audio to be used on the episode, the next episode or not, and yeah, we'll take care of it.
So last week I mentioned looking for sewing books, uh, but I knew that there was one, uh, especially a 1949 sewing singer sewing book that I had seen mentioned a lot in different conversations around vintage sewing and sewing machines, and also just learning how to sew in general, kind of like a big book of sewing. And I did actually find one for $5 on a books. This is the singer sewing book. It is from 1949. So I think this is the correct one. Again, if you know more about this than I do, and trust me, you probably do. If there's a, a better one, a different one or whatever, it's like the joy of cooking from 1975 is really good. But the next one that was released is missing a bunch of recipes that I really like. Same kind of thing, I think, with the, the singer manual that they just sort of let stuff, some stuff go away because it wasn't being done as much. I'm actually reading this. This is one of the ones by Mary Brooks. Picking. I kept saying Mary Boone, and I don't know why. I don't know why. I saw the O-N-E, O-O-N-E in my head. I was so wrong. It's Mary Brooks Pickin. Those of you who knew her must have just been screaming at me last week. I'm so sorry. But again, she's a very lovely writer and it's easy to read. And the technical drawings are really quite stupendous. Virtuoso level. So I did manage to find that. And so even without the singer book, I was able to make this dress entirely by hand and by Singer 27 Mildred machine. And you'll notice my stripes are quite good. I'm very happy with this dress. Uh, this is the dress that I was talking about, the uh, most comfortable dress in the world, according to uh, the Stitchery YouTuber. And I, I gotta say, yeah, baby. So, sewing. I also managed to lose two bolts to Mildred. I was almost done putting Mildred back together and found out, ah, one of the reasons she wasn't working is because the needle arm was bent. So that's an issue that I'm fixing. But the other part of the problem is I appear to have lost two bolts, one small and one rather sizable. And I have a little retractable magnet thing, you know, that's like a, a pointer for being a lecturer, but it's got a magnet on the end. These things are very magnetic. I have swept everywhere it could have gone. I'm actually going to pull furniture out after I take a nap after recording this and see what I can find. If you know anywhere to get old singer parts, like from people who have a machine that they're just using for parts, oh, please let me know. Because these are not parts that I've been able to find on eBay or anywhere else. I know what they're called, but I'm not going to go into it. Because this week, we have two chapters. This is beginning of volume three. So today it's volume three, chapter one, or chapters 37 and 38. In the third volume, in this last, the third act of Emma, there are a couple of really significant social faux pas that happen. And we've already seen many from Mrs. Elton. She's just appalling. She will continue to be appalling. However, she is not the perpetrator of the bigger faux pas at all in this book. So she's kind of just annoying and not really reprehensible, but definitely annoying. And oh, could you, would you just stop? The social formality that we've talked about before, things like when you go for a visit, you stay at least 15 minutes. That is the minimum polite length. That's why Emma took Harriet out of the the very, very nice family, the Martins, out of their house at uh, 14 minutes. Yeah, that was not one of Emma's better moves, I thought. But quarter of an hour is the minimum. So we get these things reinforced to us. We also get reinforced to us the thing that you do not talk to any, you do not talk about anybody by their first name unless they are family and even then probably not except when they're children. Like you could talk about Johnny, but you're not going to talk about Johnny as Johnny when Johnny is 24. That would not happen. So keep your eyes open for the social faux pas. It comes in our second chapter today. But also keep, pay attention to Frank's behavior. Frank does show back up again. We knew he would at some point. That was 
not even an issue. But for those of you who have read Emma before, you've already started seeing her laying the groundwork for Frank's end of story, where his character is at the end of the story. For those of you who haven't read Emma before, start watching Frank now in this third act, because you're probably going to figure out what's going on before I did when I first read Emma. So that's fun. A couple of usages, you know, we just don't generally talk about this anymore. You're going to hear Mrs. Elton, of course, say, I never compliment, which is not what she means in modern parlance. What she really is talking about is I never flatter. I never, I never overly praise anyone. I, you can trust me to be honest because I'm not a flatterer. Er. So that's all that means. Puppyism. We heard this back in volume one, chapter 18. So quite a while ago. Puppyism is kind of arrogance. It's not puppyism like frolicky. It's puppyism like, like conceited. So there's the kind of center of the world conceited is as close as I can get. So puppies and puppyisms refer to the same thing. Selena, S-E-L-I-N-A, is Mrs. Elton's sister. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking. What? You will hear a reference to Aladdin's lamp. Aladdin was definitely a known story at this time. It had a good part of the whole romantic period, the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s. It was certainly not an unknown quantity. So you're going to hear a reference to it, and that's perfectly, perfectly expected. This chapter is going to have a lot of Miss Bates in it. So once again, buckle in for Bates. This time, however, Jane Austen is using her very strategically. There are people who are mentioned in relationship to the dance early on in our second chapter today, but we're never given their names. And that's because Mr. Weston is the one who is letting us know, basically letting us know that these people are coming, although we're, we're told by a variety of people. Miss Bates, however, because she has this running monologue of joy all the time, unbridled excitement, she, she's the way I think of a puppy. She does give us their names. You are going to hear these names that you've never heard before get mentioned. These are people who were invited. And Miss Bates is going to say hello to them as well. But there are some truly hilarious moments where she starts a sentence, stops mid-sentence, changes to, oh, Jane, your hair is out of place. Or, oh, Emma, are you okay? Or, she is so definitionally ADHD in her speech. She is an extraordinary circle of, that's really nice. Howdy, squirrel. That is, that is her in a nutshell. There are no screens to attract her. So it's when other people enter the room, she's distracted by that and, and lets us know what's going on. There are also some parenthetical remarks in her speech, which I think are pretty clear when you're listening to it as well. Uh, there's a lot of M dashes which are potentially breaks in speech when other people are trying to talk but can't. <laughs> There's a lot of those. In reference to people being referred to by first name, you're going to hear Jane Fairfax get referred to as Jane. And the comment is going to be undertone, like whispered, that was easy. Like, that was a little too casual, rude. That's how easy is being used at that point. Normally, the first woman walked into a ball or a dance is the woman who is giving the ball, unless there's a bride around. Don't forget that these were the country dances that we're talking about, where you have the two uh, parallel lines of men and women, and they Virginia reel their way down, and the person, the, the couple at the far end, do their little dance maneuver all the way down as they promenade in between the lines of people, and then everybody moves over one position. And the next people at the end of the line do their little promenade dance all the way back. That is called a set. That's why you need enough space to have a set. And you don't want the set to be too short because they, and we've seen this in movies, they talk to each other across that open space, that no man's land in between the two lines of people. They are conversating and, and that's one of the ways you get to know the person who you might be interested in maybe a little bit. So you, you don't want to have too few people dancing if if when one of the things you want to do is be able to talk to somebody who you wouldn't otherwise be able to talk to. They talk about the men going off to play cards 
and waiting until their rubbers are made up, waiting until deals have been dealt and everything is right and proper at the card tables. Don't forget that catching someone's eye, we talked about this before with Frank, Emma and Frank and Mrs. Weston. If you catch somebody's eye in here, that is your active participation in trying to get their attention. That isn't just the casual, oh, I was looking down the street, but this caught my eye in a shop window. You know, the mannequin in the shop window did not leap out at you and go, hey, look at me. We were just distracted by it because it was wearing day-glow orange Cindy Lauper clothes. It happens. You may remember that one of the big conversations about having the dance in the crown, the hall at the crown, was that there was a draft in between where they would eat and where they would dance, or a potential draft in between. And you're going to hear Miss Bates uh, talk about, Jane, please put on your tippet. So by the end of Miss Bates doing her running monologue, she's been a great exposition machine. We know where all the chess pieces are set. We know all their names. Everything is done for us by Miss Bates. So even though it had to be really hard to write her monologues, Jane Austen loads, a, it's like Hamilton, she loads a ton of information into whatever Miss Bates is rambling on. And I am going to rely on our British compatriots who listen to Craftlet for this, 206-350-1642 or SpeakPipe. You can get to it at link, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Craftlet channel if you want to leave a SpeakPipe message. Sweetbread. Sweetbread and sweetmeats and minced pies. These are things that I have had many questions about in my life. I don't know if what I think is true is because what I think is true is kind of horrifying to me. Although I know, you know, you're supposed to use all the parts of the animal, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to let somebody else tell us about sweetbreads. And if you would, please, sweetmeats and mince as in mince pies. There are some recipes that are included in the annotations of this chapter, which include things like lamb stones. I just can't. Littleness. When I worked on Aladdin, there was a producer who was not very tall, but who I also referred to as a little, little man, because I felt like I was a foot taller than him. And I did wear heels whenever I knew he was coming. But also, he seemed to be little of spirit and little of generosity, and little of mind. And I didn't like that. You're going to hear littleness used here almost the same way. It's kind of like the lack of generosity, the, the meanness of that person's essence or soul or spirit. I think a very appropriate usage. You know, somebody has shrunk in your esteem estimation. You you no longer esteem that person's because their their reputation for you has has sunk. It has gotten little. It's that same kind of thing. Don't forget that artless, A-R-T-L-E-S-S, when talking about a, a woman's manners, is a good thing. It means she's not Mrs. Elton. She's very easygoing. She doesn't have any artifice. She's not being manipulative or untruthful about who she actually is. And that's artlessness. That's a good thing. That is everything. All right, let's listen to chapters 37 and 38. That's volume three, chapters one and two of Emma by Jane Austen. If you are listening on your own recording, please fast wind to 59 minutes, 18 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume three, chapter one. A very little quiet reflection was enough to satisfy Emma as to the nature of her agitation on hearing this news of Frank Churchill. She was soon convinced that it was not for herself she was feeling at all apprehensive or embarrassed. It was for him. Her own attachment had really subsided into a mere nothing. It was not worth thinking of. But if he— who had undoubtedly been always so much the most in love of the two, were to be returning with the same warmth of sentiment which he had taken away, it would be very distressing. If a separation of two months should not have cooled him, there were dangers and evils before her. Caution for him and for herself would be necessary. She did not mean to have her own affections entangled again, and it would be incumbent on her to avoid any encouragement of his." She wished she might be able to keep him from an absolute declaration. That would be so very painful a conclusion of their present acquaintance. And yet, she could not help rather anticipating something decisive. 
She felt as if the spring would not pass without bringing a crisis, an event, a something to alter her present composed and tranquil state. It was not very long, though rather longer than Mr. Weston had foreseen, before she had the power of forming some opinion of Frank Churchill's feelings. The Enscombe family were not in town quite so soon as had been imagined, but he was at Highbury very soon afterwards. He rode down for a couple of hours, he could not yet do more, but as he came from Randall's immediately to Hartfield, she could then exercise all her quick observation, and speedily determine how he was influenced, and how she must act. They met with the utmost friendliness. There could be no doubt of his great pleasure in seeing her. But she had an almost instant doubt of his caring for her as he had done, of his feeling the same tenderness in the same degree. She watched him well. It was a clear thing he was less in love than he had been. Absence, with the conviction probably of her indifference, had produced this very natural and very desirable effect. He was in high spirits, as ready to talk and laugh as ever, and seemed delighted to speak of his former visit, and to recur to old stories, and he was not without agitation. It was not in his calmness that she read his comparative difference. He was not calm. His spirits were evidently fluttered. There was restlessness about him. Lively as he was, it seemed a liveliness that did not satisfy himself. But what decided her belief on the subject was his staying only a quarter of an hour, and hurrying away to make other calls in Highbury. He had seen a group of old acquaintance in the street as he had passed. He had not stopped, he would not stop for more than a word, but he had the vanity to think they would be disappointed if he did not call, and much as he wished to stay longer at Hartfield, he must hurry off. She had no doubt as to his being less in love, but neither his agitated spirits, nor his hurrying away, seemed like a perfect cure, and she was rather inclined to think it implied a dread of her returning power, and a discreet resolution of not trusting himself with her long. This was the only visit from Frank Churchill in the course of ten days. He was often hoping, intending to come, but was always prevented. His aunt could not bear to have him leave her. Such was his own account at Randall's. If he were quite sincere, if he really tried to come, it was to be inferred that Mrs. Churchill's removal to London had been of no service to the willful or nervous part of her disorder. That she was really ill was very certain. He had declared himself convinced of it at Randall's. Though much might be fancy, he could not doubt when he looked back that she was in a weaker state of health than she had been half a year ago. He did not believe it to proceed from anything that care and medicine might not remove, or at least that she might not have many years of existence before her, but he could not be prevailed on, by all his father's doubts, to say that her complaints were merely imaginary, or that she was as strong as ever. It soon appeared that London was not the place for her. She could not endure its noise. Her nerves were under continual irritation and suffering, and by the ten days' end her nephew's letter to Randall's communicated a change of plan. They were going to remove immediately to Richmond. Mrs. Churchill had been recommended to the medical skill of an eminent person there, and had otherwise a fancy for the place. A ready furnished house in a favorite spot was engaged, and much benefit expected from the change. Emma heard that Frank wrote in the highest spirits of this arrangement, and seemed most fully to appreciate the blessing of having two months before him of such near neighborhood to many dear friends, for the house was taken for May and June. She was told that now he wrote with the greatest confidence of being often with them, almost as often as he could even wish. Emma saw how Mr. Weston understood these joyous prospects. He was considering her as the source of all the happiness they offered. She hoped it was not so. Two months must bring it to the proof. Mr. Weston's own happiness was indisputable. He was quite delighted. It was the very circumstance he could have wished for. Now it would really be having Frank in their neighborhood. What were nine miles to a young man? An hour's ride. He would be always coming over. The difference in that respect of Richmond and London was enough to make the whole difference of seeing him always and seeing him never. Sixteen miles, nay, eighteen, it must be full eighteen to Manchester Street, was a serious obstacle. Were he ever able to get away, the day would be spent in coming and returning. There was no comfort in having him in London. He might as well be at Enscombe. But Richmond was the very distance for easy intercourse, better than nearer. One good thing was immediately brought to a certainty by this removal, the ball at the Crown. It had not been forgotten before, but it had been soon acknowledged vain to attempt to fix a day. 
Now, however, it was absolutely to be. Every preparation was resumed, and very soon after the Churchills had removed to Richmond, a few lines from Frank, to say that his aunt felt already much better for the change, and that he had no doubt of being able to join them for twenty-four hours at any given time, induced them to name as early a day as possible. Mr. Weston's ball was to be a real thing. A very few to-morrow stood between the young people of Highbury and happiness. Mr. Woodhouse was resigned. The time of year lightened the evil to him. May was better for everything than February. Mrs. Bates was engaged to spend the evening at Hartfield. James had due notice, and he sanguinely hoped that neither dear little Henry nor dear little John would have anything the matter with them while dear Emma was gone. End of chapter 1 Volume 3 Chapter 2 No misfortune occurred again to prevent the ball. The day approached, the day arrived, and after a morning of some anxious watching, Frank Churchill, in all the certainty of his own self, reached Randall's before dinner, and everything was safe. No second meeting had there yet been between him and Emma. The room at the Crown was to witness it, but it would be better than a common meeting in a crowd. Mr. Weston had been so very earnest in his entreaties for her arriving there as soon as possible after themselves, for the purpose of taking her opinion as to the propriety and comfort of the rooms before any other persons came, that she could not refuse him, and must therefore spend some quiet interval in the young man's company. She was to convey Harriet, and they drove to the Crown in good time, the Randalls' party just sufficiently before them. Frank Churchill seemed to have been on the watch, and though he did not say much, his eyes declared that he meant to have a delightful evening. They all walked about together, to see that everything was as it should be, and within a few minutes were joined by the contents of another carriage, which Emma could not hear the sound of at first without great surprise. "'So unreasonably early!' she was going to exclaim, but she presently found that it was a family of old friends, who were coming, like herself, by a particular desire to help Mr. Weston's judgment, and they were so very closely followed by another carriage of cousins, who had been entreated to come early with the same distinguishing earnestness on the same errand, that it seemed as if half the company might soon be collected together for the purpose of preparatory inspection. Emma perceived that her taste was not the only taste on which Mr. Weston depended, and felt that to be the favourite and intimate of a man who had so many intimates and confidants was not the very first distinction in the scale of vanity. She liked his open manners, but a little less of open-heartedness would have made him a higher character. General benevolence, but not general friendship, made a man what he ought to be. She could fancy such a man. The whole party walked about, and looked and praised again, and then, having nothing else to do, formed a sort of half-circle round the fire, to observe in their various modes, till other subjects were started, that though May, a fire in the evening was still very pleasant. Emma found that it was not Mr. Weston's fault that the number of privy councillors was not yet larger. They had stopped at Mrs. Bates's door to offer the use of their carriage, but the aunt and niece were to be brought by the Eltons. Frank was standing by her, but not steadily. There was a restlessness which showed a mind not at ease. He was looking about, he was going to the door, he was watching for the sound of other carriages, impatient to begin, or afraid of being always near her. Mrs. Elton was spoken of. "'I think she must be here soon,' said he. "'I have a great curiosity to see Mrs. Elton. I have heard so much of her. It cannot be long, I think, before she comes.' A carriage was heard. He was on the move immediately, but, coming back, said, "'I am forgetting that I am not acquainted with her. I have never seen either Mr. or Mrs. Elton. I have no business to put myself forward.' Mr. and Mrs. Elton appeared, and all the smiles and the proprieties passed. "'But Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax,' said Mr. Weston, looking about, "'we thought you were to bring them.' The mistake had been slight. The carriage was sent for them now. Emma longed to know what Frank's first opinion of Mrs. Elton might be, how he was affected by the studied elegance of her dress, and her smiles of graciousness. He was immediately qualifying himself to form an opinion by giving her very proper attention, after the introduction had passed.' In a few minutes the carriage returned. Somebody talked of rain. "'I will see that there are umbrellas, sir,' said Frank to his father. "'Miss Bates must not be forgotten.' And away he went. 
Mr. Weston was following, but Mrs. Elton detained him, to gratify him by her opinion of his son, and so briskly did she begin that the young man himself, though by no means moving slowly, could hardly be out of hearing. "'A very fine young man indeed, Mr. Weston. You know I candidly told you I should form my own opinion, and I am happy to say that I am extremely pleased with him. You may believe me. I never compliment. I think him a very handsome young man, and his manners are precisely what I like and approve, so truly the gentleman, without the least conceit or puppyism. You must know I have a vast dislike to puppies, quite a horror of them. They were never tolerated at Maple Grove. Neither Mr. Suckling nor me had ever any patience with them, and we used sometimes to say very cutting things. Selina, who was mild almost to a fault, bore with them much better. While she talked of his son, Mr. Weston's attention was chained, but when she got to Maple Grove, he could recollect that there were ladies just arriving to be attended to, and with happy smiles must hurry away. Mrs. Elton turned to Mrs. Weston. I have no doubt of its being our carriage with Miss Bates and Jane. Our coachman and horses are so extremely expeditious. I believe we drive faster than anybody. What a pleasure it is to send one's carriage for a friend. I understand you were so kind as to offer, but another time it will be quite unnecessary. You may be very sure I shall always take care of them. Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax, escorted by the two gentlemen, walked into the room, and Mrs. Elton seemed to think it as much her duty as Mrs. Weston's to receive them. Her gestures and movements might be understood by any one who looked on like Emma, but her words, everybody's words, were soon lost under the incessant flow of Miss Bates, who came in talking and had not finished her speech under many minutes after her being admitted into the circle at the fire. As the door opened, she was heard— "'Oh, so very obliging of you! No rain at all! Nothing to signify! I do not care for myself! Quite thick shoes! And Jane declares, "'Well!' as soon as she was within the door. "'Well, this is brilliant indeed! This is admirable! Excellently contrived, upon my word! Nothing wanting! Could not have imagined it! So well lighted up! Jane! Jane! Look! Did you ever see anything—' "'Oh, Mr. Weston, you must really have had Aladdin's lamp. "'Good Mrs. Stokes would not know her own room again. "'I saw her as I came in. She was standing in the entrance. "'Oh, Mrs. Stokes,' said I, but I had not time for more. "'She was now met by Mrs. Weston. "'Very well, I thank you, ma'am. I hope you were quite well. "'Very happy to hear it. So afraid you might have a headache, "'seeing you pass by so often and knowing how much trouble you must have. "'Delighted to hear it indeed.' "'Ah, oh, dear Mrs. Elton, so obliged to you for the carriage. Excellent time. Jane and I quite ready. Did not keep the horses a moment. Most comfortable carriage. Oh, and I am sure our thanks are due to you, Mrs. Weston, on that score. Mrs. Elton had most kindly sent Jane a note, or we should have been. But two such offers in one day! Never were such neighbours. I said to my mother, "'Upon my word, ma'am, thank you. My mother is remarkably well. Gone to Mr. Woodhouse's.' I made her take her shawl, for the evenings are not warm, her large new shawl, Mrs. Dixon's wedding present, so kind of her to think of my mother, bought at Weymouth, you know, Mr. Dixon's choice. There were three others, Jane says, which they hesitated about some time. Colonel Campbell rather preferred an olive. My dear Jane, are you sure you did not twitch your feet? It was but a drop or two, but I am so afraid. But Mr. Frank Churchill was so extremely— and there was a mat to step upon. I shall never forget his extreme politeness. Oh, Mr. Frank Churchill, I must tell you my mother's spectacles have never been in fault since. The rivet never came out again. My mother often talks of your good nature, does not she, Jane? Do we not often talk of Mr. Frank Churchill? Ah, oh, here's Miss Woodhouse. Dear Miss Woodhouse, how do you do? Very well, I thank you, quite well. This is meeting quite in fairyland. Such a transformation. Must not come compliment, I know, eyeing Emma most complacently. That would be rude, but upon my word, Miss Woodhouse, you do look. How do you like Jane's hair? You are a judge. She did it all herself. Quite wonderful how she does her hair. No hairdresser from London, I think, could. Ah, oh, Dr. Hughes, I declare, and Mrs. Hughes. Must go and speak to Dr. and Mrs. Hughes for a moment. How do you do? How do you do? Very well, I thank you. This is delightful, is it not? Where's dear Mr. Richard?' "'Oh, there he is. Don't disturb him. Much better employed talking to the young ladies. How do you do, Mr. Richard? I saw you the other day as you rode through the town. 
Mrs. Otway, I protest, and good Mr. Otway, and Miss Otway, and Miss Caroline, such a host of friends, and Mr. George, and Mr. Arthur, how do you do, how do you do? Quite well, I am much obliged to you, never better. Don't I hear another carriage? Who can this be? Oh, very likely the worthy Coles. Upon my word, this is charming to be standing out among such friends, and such a noble fire. I am quite roasted. No coffee, I thank you, for me never take coffee. A little tea, if you please, sir, by and by. No hurry. Oh, here it comes. Everything's so good. Frank Churchill returned to his station by Emma, and as soon as Miss Bates was quiet, she found herself necessarily overhearing the discourse of Mrs. Elton and Miss Fairfax, who were standing a little way behind her. He was thoughtful. Whether he were overhearing, too, she could not determine. After a good many compliments to Jane on her dress and look, compliments very quietly and properly taken, Mrs. Elton was evidently wanting to be complimented herself, and it was, "'How do you like my gown?' "'How do you like my trimming? How has Wright done my hair?' With many other relative questions, all answered with patient politeness. Mrs. Elton then said, "'Nobody can think less of dress in general than I do, but upon such an occasion as this, when everybody's eyes are so much upon me, and in compliment to the Westons, who I have no doubt are giving this ball chiefly to do me honour, I would not wish to be inferior to others, and I see very few pearls in the room except mine.' "'So Frank Churchill is a capital dancer, I understand. We shall see if our styles suit. A fine young man certainly is Mr. Frank Churchill. I like him very well.' At this moment Frank began talking so vigorously that Emma could not but imagine he had overheard his own praises, and did not want to hear more. And the voices of the ladies were drowned for a while, till another suspension brought Mrs. Elton's tones again distinctly forward. Mr. Elton had just joined them, and his wife was exclaiming, "'Oh, so you have found us out at last, have you, in our seclusion? I was this moment telling Jane I thought she would begin to be impatient for tidings of us.' "'Jane,' repeated Frank Churchill, with a look of surprise and displeasure, "'that is easy, but Miss Fairfax does not disapprove it, I suppose.' "'How do you like Mrs. Elton?' said Emma, in a whisper. "'Not at all.' <laughs> "'You are ungrateful.' "'Ungrateful? What do you mean?' Then changing from a frown to a smile. "'No, do not tell me. I do not want to know what you mean. Where is my father? When are we to begin dancing?' Emma could hardly understand him. He seemed in an odd humour. He walked off to find his father, but was quickly back again with both Mr. and Mrs. Weston. He had met with them in a little perplexity which must be laid before Emma. It had just occurred to Mrs. Weston that Mrs. Elton must be asked to begin the ball, that she would expect it, which interfered with all their wishes of giving Emma that distinction. Emma heard the sad truth with fortitude. "'And what are we to do for a proper partner for her?' said Mr. Weston. "'She will think Frank ought to ask her.' Frank turned instantly to Emma, to claim her former promise, and boasted himself an engaged man, which his father looked his most perfect approbation of, and it then appeared that Mrs. Weston was wanting him to dance with Mrs. Elton himself, and that their business was to help to persuade him into it, which was done pretty soon. Mr. Weston and Mrs. Elton led the way, Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse followed. Emma must submit to stand second to Mrs. Elton, though she had always considered the ball as peculiarly for her. It was almost enough to make her think of marrying. Mrs. Elton had undoubtedly the advantage, at this time, in vanity completely gratified, for though she had intended to begin with Frank Churchill, she could not lose by the change. Mr. Weston might be his son's superior. In spite of this little rub, however, Emma was smiling with enjoyment, delighted to see the respectable length of the set as it was forming, and to feel that she had so many hours of unusual festivity before her. She was more disturbed by Mr. Knightley's not dancing than anything else. There he was, among the standers-by, where he ought not to be, he ought to be dancing, not classing himself with the husbands and fathers and whist-players, who were pretending to feel an interest in the dance till their rubbers were made up, so young as he looked. He could not have appeared to greater advantage, perhaps anywhere, than where he had placed himself. His tall, firm, upright figure, among the bulky forms and stooping shoulders of the elderly men, was such as Emma felt must draw everybody's eyes, and excepting her own partner, there was not one among the whole row of young men who could be compared with him. He moved a few steps nearer, and those few steps were enough to prove in how gentlemanlike a manner, with what natural grace, he must have danced, would he but take the trouble. 
Whenever she caught his eye, she forced him to smile, but in general he was looking grave. She wished he could love a ballroom better, and could like Frank Churchill better. He seemed often observing her. She must not flatter herself that he thought of her dancing, but if he were criticizing her behavior, she did not feel afraid. There was nothing like flirtation between her and her partner. They seemed more like cheerful, easy friends than lovers. That Frank Churchill thought less of her than he had done was indubitable. The ball proceeded pleasantly. The anxious cares, the incessant attentions of Mrs. Weston were not thrown away. Everybody seemed happy, and the praise of being a delightful ball, which is seldom bestowed till after a ball has ceased to be, was repeatedly given in the very beginning of the existence of this. Of very important, recordable events, it was not more productive than such meanings usually are. There was one, however, which Emma thought something of. The two last dances before supper were begun, and Harriet had no partner the only young lady sitting down, and so equal had been hitherto the number of dancers, that how there could be any one disengaged was the wonder. But Emma's wonder lessened soon afterwards on seeing Mr. Elton sauntering about. He would not ask Harriet to dance if it were possible to be avoided. She was sure he would not, and she was expecting him every moment to escape into the card-room. Escape, however, was not his plan. He came to the part of the room where the sitters-by were collected, spoke to some, and walked about in front of them, as if to show his liberty and his resolution of maintaining it. He did not omit being sometimes directly before Miss Smith, or speaking to those who were close to her. Emma saw it. She was not yet dancing. She was working her way up from the bottom, and had therefore leisure to look around, and by only turning her head a little she saw it all. When she was halfway up the set, the whole group were exactly behind her, and she would no longer allow her eyes to watch. But Mr. Elton was so near, that she heard every syllable of a dialogue which just then took place between him and Mrs. Weston, and she perceived that his wife— who was standing immediately above her, was not only listening also, but even encouraging him by significant glances. The kind-hearted, gentle Mrs. Weston had left her seat to join him and say, "'Do not you dance, Mr. Elton?' to which his prompt reply was, "'Most readily, Mrs. Weston, if you will dance with me.' "'Me? Oh, no! I would get you a better partner than myself. I am no dancer.' "'If Mrs. Gilbert wishes to dance,' said he, I shall have great pleasure, I am sure, for though beginning to feel myself rather an old married man, and that my dancing days are over, it would give me very great pleasure at any time to stand up with an old friend like Mrs. Gilbert. Mrs. Gilbert does not mean to dance, but there is a young lady disengaged whom I should be very glad to see dancing. Miss Smith. Miss Smith? Oh, I had not observed. You are extremely obliging, and if I were not an old married man— but my dancing days are over, Mrs. Weston. You will excuse me. Anything else I should be most happy to do at your command, but my dancing days are over. Mrs. Weston said no more, and Emma could imagine with what surprise and mortification she must be returning to her seat. This was Mr. Elton, the amiable, obliging, gentle Mr. Elton. She looked round for a moment. He had joined Mr. Knightley at a little distance, and was arranging himself for settled conversation, while smiles of high glee passed between him and his wife. She would not look again. Her heart was in a glow, and she feared her face might be as hot. In another moment a happier sight caught her. Mr. Knightley leading Harriet to the set. Never had she been more surprised, seldom more delighted, than at that instant— she was all pleasure and gratitude, both for Harriet and herself, and longed to be thanking him, and though too distant for speech, her countenance said much as soon as she could catch his eye again. His dancing proved to be just what she had believed it, extremely good, and Harriet would have seemed almost too lucky if it had not been for the cruel state of things before, and for the very complete enjoyment and very high sense of the distinction which her happy features announced. It was not thrown away on her. She bounded higher than ever, flew farther down the middle, and was in a continual course of smiles. Mr. Elton had retreated into the card-room, looking, Emma trusted, very foolish. She did not think he was quite so hardened as his wife, though growing very like her. She spoke some of her feelings, by observing audibly to her partner, "'Nightly has taken pity on poor little Miss Smith. Very good-natured, I declare.' Supper was announced, the move began, and Miss Bates might be heard from that moment without interruption, till her being seated at table and taking up her spoon. "'Jane! Jane! My dear Jane, where are you? Here is your tippet. 
Mrs. Weston begs you to put on your tippet. She says she is afraid there will be draughts in the passage. Though everything has been done, one door nailed up, quantities of matting. My dear Jane, indeed you must. Mr. Churchill, oh, you are too obliging. How well you put it on. So gratified. Excellent dancing, indeed. Yes, my dear, I ran home, as I said I should, to help Grandmamma to bed, and got back again, and nobody missed me. I set off without saying a word, just as I told you. Grandmamma was quite well, had a charming evening with Mr. Woodhouse, a vast deal of chat and backgammon. Tea was made downstairs, biscuits and baked apples and wine before she came away. Amazing luck in some of her throws, and she inquired a great deal about you, how you were amused and who were your partners? Oh, said I, I shall not forestall Jane. I left her dancing with Mr. George Otway. She will love to tell you all about it herself to-morrow. Her first partner was Mr. Elton. I do not know who will ask her next, except perhaps Mr. William Cox. My dear sir, you are too obliging. Is there nobody you would not rather? I am not helpless. Sir, you are most kind. Upon my word, Jane on one arm and me on the other. Stop, stop, let us stand a little back. Mrs. Elton is going. Dear Mrs. Elton, how elegant she looks! Beautiful lace! Now we all follow in her train, quite the queen of the evening. Well, here we are at the passage. Two steps, Jane, take care of the two steps. Oh, no, there is but one. Well, I was persuaded there were two. How very odd! I was convinced there were two, and there is but one. I never saw anything equal to the comfort and style. Candles everywhere! I was telling you of your grandmamma, Jane. There was a little disappointment. The baked apples and biscuits, excellent in their way, you know, but there was a delicate fricassee of sweet bread and some asparagus brought in first, and good Mr. Woodhouse, not thinking the asparagus quite boiled enough, sent it out again. Now there is nothing grandmamma loves better than sweet bread and asparagus, so she was rather disappointed, but we agreed we would not speak of it to anybody, for fear of its getting round to dear Miss Woodhouse, who would be so very much concerned. Well, this is brilliant. I am all amazement. Could not have supposed anything. Such elegance and profusion. I have seen nothing like it since. Well, where shall we sit? Where shall we sit? Anywhere so that Jane is not in a draught. Where I sit is of no consequence. Oh, do you recommend this side? Well, I am sure, Mr. Churchill. Only it seems too good. But just as you please, what you direct in this house cannot be wrong. Dear Jane, how shall we ever recollect half the dishes for Grandmamma? Soup, too! Bless me! I should not be helped so soon, but it smells most excellent, and I cannot help beginning. Emma had no opportunity of speaking to Mr. Knightley till after supper, but when they were all in the ballroom again, her eyes invited him irresistibly to come to her and be thanked. He was warm in his reprobation of Mr. Elton's conduct. It had been unpardonable rudeness, and Mrs. Elton's looks also received the due share of censure. They aimed at wounding more than Harriet, said he. Emma, why is it that they are your enemies? He looked with smiling penetration, and on receiving no answer, added, She ought not to be angry with you, I suspect, whatever he may be. To that surmise you say nothing, of course. But confess, Emma, that you did want him to marry Harriet. I did, replied Emma, and they cannot forgive me. He shook his head, but there was a smile of indulgence with it, and he only said, "'I shall not scold you. I leave you to your own reflections. Can you trust me with such flatterers? Does my vain spirit ever tell me I am wrong?' "'Not your vain spirit, but your serious spirit. If one leads you wrong, I am sure the other tells you of it. I do own myself to have been completely mistaken in Mr. Elton. There is a littleness about him which you discovered and which I did not, and I was fully convinced of his being in love with Harriet. It was through a series of strange blunders. And in return for your acknowledging so much, I will do you the justice to say that you would have chosen for him better than he has chosen for himself. Harriet Smith has some first-rate qualities, which Mrs. Elton is totally without— an unpretending, single-minded, artless girl, infinitely to be preferred by any man of sense and taste to a woman such as Mrs. Elton. I found Harriet more conversable than I expected. Emma was extremely gratified. They were interrupted by the bustle of Mr. Weston calling on everybody to begin dancing again. "'Come, Miss Woodhouse, Miss Otway, Miss Fairfax, what are you all doing? Come, Emma, set your companions the example. Everybody is lazy, everybody's asleep.' "'I am ready.' said Emma, whenever I am wanted. "'Whom are you going to dance with?' asked Mr. Knightley. She hesitated a moment and then replied, "'With you, if you will ask me.' "'Will you?' said he, offering his hand. "'Indeed I will. You have shown that you can dance, 
and you know we are not really so much brother and sister as to make it at all improper. Brother and sister? No, indeed. End of chapter two. All right, so we've got some really interesting, juicy stuff. We're getting to the good stuff now. Not that it hasn't all been glorious, but but now things are starting to come together. The Churchills start out in London. Manchester Street is near Marylebone, is in Marylebone, that section of fashionable London at the time. And there's a lot of open squares there. But Richmond, which was, I think, developed by Henry VII, Richmond Palace started with him, or was Henry VIII? I think it was Henry VII. Um, Lots of open green space at this time. So for her, the city's a little too loud, and it makes perfect sense for her to go to, to Richmond. However, we have a distance measurement from Highbury to Richmond, and we have a distance measurement from Highbury to London. And according to people who know more than me, those two things do not line up. So Hartfield is definitely not a real place, but it is absolutely being presented as though it were. Hartfield and, and Highbury. So it, it's just an impossible location for the times that were given. And we know that Jane Austen was very specific about these times. She puts them in for reasons. So there is the whole discussion about being much closer, like two hours away versus a day away, and Richmond's closer to them than getting to London. And that's just awesome. I thought it was fascinating that Emma, at the beginning of our second chapter, you know, we, we've seen Mr. Weston. He's ebullient. He's very generous. He's, he's a lovely, loving guy with a big, big heart. And that doesn't always make it easy to get along with him. And, and I thought Emma's commenting that there's a scale of vanity. You like having your, your opinion being asked for. But when you find out that everybody else got their opinion asked for as well. It kind of dilutes the importance of your contribution. And Emma's not entirely sure that she's happy about that, but she'll let it go. But, you know, that may be annoying, but it's honest. I get it. And then if, right from the get-go, Frank shows up and Frank was standing by her, but not steadily. It made me very happy that Emma is very clear, and she does not seem to be backtracking on this, that there is no love between her and Frank Churchill. She figured out her reasons for why she is not in love with him, and she is now convinced because of the way that he has visited for 15 minutes, and that's all, plus other things that he is not interested in her either. But there are also things like Frank was standing by her, but not steadily. That is, that is an interesting word. I don't know if that means he's fidgeting or if he's going back and forth from one foot to another or or what, but he's not steady. It could just be emotionally that the vibe which she was getting off of him was that he's not steady. Sums up. And you get more and more of that as he's like going down to check and make sure he escorts the people in and oh, it's not Miss Bates. It's the Eltons. I can't go escort the Eltons in because I don't know them. That would be rude. That wouldn't be what is done. Not the thing that when, when she finally gets a chance to talk to Mr. Weston about Frank, a fine, very fine young man indeed, Mr. Weston, you know I candidly told you I should form my own opinion, and I am happy to say that I am extremely pleased with him. Oh, thank you. We've all been waiting to know what you thought of Frank. Nifty. Moving on. Before, I drew a lot of scream faces and OMGs in the margins when she would talk. This time, all of my faces in the margins are smiley faces, except they're sticking out their tongue and they're not smiley, they're franny faces. I hope your eyes rolled when Mrs. Elton was talking about how she was convinced that this ball was being given in her honor. And Emma doesn't really like that because Emma kind of thought this was for her. And then she kind of moves away from that whole conversation in her head pretty quickly because. Does that mean she's just like Mrs. Elton? And we can't think that way. That's just not okay. We're going to move on to the next thing to be distracted by. I thought that the, the little whispered conversation between Frank and Emma about Mrs. Elton's use of the Jane Fairfax's first name was really nicely done because it does feel they're very short sentences. And we know Jane Austen can write very long sentences when she wants to, but they're just very, very short sentences. 
and you get the feeling that they're, you know, like espionage leaning over each other's shoulder going, did you see that? I saw that. What do you think? I don't like it. Me either. It's just very clear from the way it's written because Jane Austen is a genius. One of the not faux pas that were done in today's chapters was Mr. Knightley stepping in to save Harriet from just a horrible, horrible slight. And that is the first major breaking of the larger social contract about how men and women are supposed to treat each other. Not only does Elton slight Harriet specifically and within her hearing on purpose, but he's looking at his wife and smiling as he's doing it. And that is an extra layer of cruelty. The first time I read this book, I was kind of horrified in this chapter. And I think we're supposed to be pretty horrified by by both of their behavior. She's to be expected, but he is definitely proving himself to be a little, little man. And for Knightley to step up, after having said he's not interested in dancing, but to step up and dance with Harriet and be all of the things that a gentleman should be and actually know how to dance. That's interesting because as we know, if especially if you watch that, uh, that video on learning Regency dances and, and putting on a ball, this required some teaching. So somebody taught Mr. Knightley or he procured one of those dance books, the little pamphlets that had the dance steps written out in it and learned that way. That would be another way he could learn. And we didn't know about that. Or I didn't know about that anyway until I researched that part of the book. If you have been living under a rock, have never seen one of the movies of Emma or read the book before, the very last line and the last two paragraphs of three paragraphs of this chapter are important foreshadowing for you. And it's when Emma decides that she she will dance with Mr. Knightley if he asks her. And she makes the joke of we're not so much brother and sister that this would be a problem. And his reaction is very clear. Brother and sister, exclamation point. No, indeed. And that's where Jane Austen ends that chapter. So, perhaps Knightley, knowing that this dance was probably going to happen, had a reason to learn how to dance. Could be. We don't know. But we know that he likes Emma to dance and have fun, and that he enjoys being there when other people, young people, are out having a good time dancing. He just, you know, hasn't had a good reason to dance before. It just makes me happy. All right. That is it for me for today. I hope you had a good time with chapters 37 and 38 or volume three, chapters one and two. Don't forget, there will be a new raffle that we will announce for August that will also be announced in the newsletter that will come out. The Big Sleep is coming out this Thursday night, or actually came out last night, if you are listening to this on Friday. And soon I will be announcing our next book and movie airing for, oh my God, August and September. Um, it is a flying. All right, take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.